Welcome back, Chelsea fans, to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast, your home for all things Chelsea FC. Nick, Dan, and myself cover all the match reviews from the latest Chelsea matches. We cover the team news and even throw you some exclusive interviews. Thank you already for being an awesome listener. And you know what? Let's jump right in. That is right, Chelsea fans. Welcome back to yet another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. Let's see. It is another Sunday game, guys, and it was a little bit more exciting for us today. It was cool. We actually had a huge turnout at the at Brit's Pub today. So, um, Mike, obviously, you're jumping in with us, and we have Nick and Dan on the line. For you, were you back at Doyle's Pub holding it down out west? As, as always, uh, there were two of us today. <laughs> so, wow. It's- a small showing. I mean, the funny thing is, I feel like these six, these six fifteen, six thirty games are always. I, I feel like it's where people hit the snooze button one too many times because, like, if you're going to the four thirty match, you are determined, and then you know anything later than that, you're gonna you're gonna be fine. But I think that six o'clock, it just is always poor showing there. Well, I can make you all feel better about yourselves. The Liverpool fans uh watched the Liverpool match on tape delay at Brits today in the other room. Oh <sighs> why? But with the internet you already know the score. <laughs> they That's came awful. in, hands over ears, na 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 don't tell me anything. Did you ruin it for him? Did you could, please tell me you ruined it for him? No. I had more important things going no, the, on. No, the opposition ruined it for him because it's Fulham and they're absolutely god awful. <laughs> I had higher hopes for them. As did I. <laughs> As did I. <laughs> You know, it's worse than that, though. Uh, we had um, Liverpool fans cheering on Everton in our pub today. That was oh, a joy to a watch. Fuck. The irony is thick. Yep. All right. Well, Nick, Kansas City, you guys uh, get together today, or what, what was the plan? Uh, I watched from my couch today, um, which I know isn't like a great story. However, I went to the Sporting Kansas City playoff game uh, for MLS playoffs, so had to kind of pick my battles there. I didn't want to be out for 13 straight hours. So uh, going up on a Sunday here on the couch on, on the old uh, Kansas City time. So That sounds counter counter to what going up on a Sunday would be like, Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, but then I had three tank sevens pre-gaming. So, you know, it all, it's all about balance, Dan, uh, you know, <laughs> yoga and such, you know. Well, and a congratulations to Dan, who has now completed his – Drive across the country, literally starting in Georgia, ending in California. You made it, man. I did. You know, it was uh, it was great to see multiple parts of the country that I had not been before. I think in uh, Sedona was absolutely gorgeous. That was really cool in Arizona. And there's a lot of New Mexico that's absolutely flat land. And you see tumbleweeds like in the cartoons. And that was really cool. Um and then my wife wanted to go to Disneyland, so we went to Disneyland. We what? Now we're open. Wait, wait a minute. That's what? a shocker. If only, if only our audience knew how that your wife loves Disney more than all of us love Chelsea combined. I think that's the only way for us to kind of Le- legitimately, explain. like a hundred percent true. Yeah, that, that that's a, actually about factually accurate in terms of the percentages there. Awesome. Well, speaking of super awesome, I do want to kick this podcast off with a a very brief discussion on uh, Didier retiring per other sources and then him coming out, Nick, and just dropping that boss gif. (laughs) Dude, Uh, first of all, it's gif, Brandon. But um, second of all, let me just say, and I've said this before and I will say it again, we are all desperate to retire players before they want to retire. (laughs) Uh, fans are like, hey, there's a storybook ending. You should just stop doing the thing that you've only done your entire life. Uh, so Didier, uh, you know, a little sneaky. Maybe he let on that he was going to retire a little bit. Came, came out on, was it was it Friday? Or was it, it was Thursday? Thursday. Thursday. Thursday, yeah. After, after uh, Phoenix Rising had not won the USL Championship, and did the um, Leonardo DiCaprio, Wolf of Wall Street, I'm not bleeping leaving uh, as his clip. <laughs> and and everybody lost their mind, like including us. You know, if you saw our, our Twitter, Instagram feeds, Mike then in short order published the uh, Didier's head on Leonardo DiCaprio's shoulders 
photo with the king crown on top. Like, it was beautiful. It's just another example of how this dude is unbelievable all the time, no matter what. Even in defeat, he is still the king. And, uh, you know, guys, look, all, all we can do is tip our tip our cap to Didier and, and hope that he does whatever the hell he wants to do next because he deserves it. I, I will then, say, Wolf of Wall Street could have been better with Drogba in the DiCaprio role. Oh, 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 oh. interesting, Dan. I did not know we were... It was it was uh, Siskel and Dormer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, two thumbs way up for that joke, Nick. Thank you. All right. Well then, and also in recent news, uh, Mike, a huge shout out to at the real Joel Cole on another birthday for him, which is fun for us because obviously we interviewed him uh, in was it been August, late July now? So it, definitely July. Um, I think that has to be <laughs> one of one of my favorite moments because. You know, to to meet a legend like that, and I, I cannot think of someone I've ever met who is more accommodating and just down to earth. Um, you know, between how much time he gave us in the the second interview we had with him, or I guess the real interview, and then waiting after the match and sit around and talking with us, um, just an absolute amazing person yeah definitely the real interview just to clarify so anyways with that being said uh let's go ahead and pivot on over to the match review but as always i'd like to tease you guys before we get there and nick we do have um a quick update for everyone correct brandon uh we are still going to london i know that shocks nobody uh, but we are still going uh we are getting close though however to like the deadline to sign up for the trip so if you are interested at all in coming to London with us to see Crystal Palace away and Southampton home, perhaps even doing Watford beforehand or the FA Cup trip after um, the Southampton game, just let us know. DM us, email us, uh, contact at londonisbluepodcast.com, and we will take care of you. We just want to make sure that everyone gets their, um, their registrations in on time so that we can can accommodate for everything we are currently still working on the new year's eve plans and perhaps a little new year's day plan we're getting closer to solidifying the um the live podcast with our friends at the chelsea fan cast which uh, i i know for for all who are you know dying to know it looks like chidge will will make it now which is just tremendous because he's unbelievable to to do a live pod with so we're really pumped about that and uh yeah we're just really excited to go so uh, get your stuff together DM us. There is no stupid question. We, we uh, ourselves, and I know that Brandon can confirm this, have uh, now done this a few times. So we, we've stumbled through some stuff and we actually are, are better off for it. So uh, just let us know. Nick, I think the real question people have, though, that's hinging on a couple of subscriptions to the trip. Will you have a beard in December, or are we going to be treated to the baby face boy from Kansas City? Uh, I can confirm that I will have a, a full, uh, luxurious, and a downright uh, beautiful beard uh, by the time we get back to London in December. You are the definition of a quitter when it comes to no shave November. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm a, I'm a hero when it comes to no shave. I shaved once. And I'm not shaving again. It's like, what are you not good about this? <sighs> All right. Well, here we go. Uh, match review time. It was Everton in the Premier League at Stamford Bridge this past Sunday, November 11th. In case you missed this goal fest of a thriller, uh, Chelsea zero, Everton also zero. And uh, I didn't see any correct score predictions. Uh, but apparently a shout out to Mark Berman from Facebook. He did. He predicted Palace, but we didn't read the results last week. So... My bad, Mark. You earned. This is a great week to have a shout out. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can't all be perfect like you, Nick. So as we move on, Dan, I will let you read out uh, Cerismo's four three three lineup. Yeah, no surprise. Kepa in the back. Rudiger, Luis, Alonso, Aspilicueta, back four. Solid as a rock. Jorginho, Conte, Kovacic in the midfield. Hazard, William. Morata up top. Saw a bench of Willie Caballero, Davide Zapacosta, Andreas Christensen, Seth Fabregas, Ross Barkley, Pedro, and the one and only sexy, meaty French forehead, Olivier Giroud. Sesk, 
Barkley, Pedro are the three who made appearances off the bench, and uh, pretty much what you would expect, Mike, given the fact that midweek, you know, you saw a lot of minutes for a couple of our players. Yeah, I, I think we, I think we were expecting to see Barkley a little bit earlier than he came on, but kind of back to that starting eleven that we've seen so much of. Um, I don't know. Uh, the game has left a bit of a bad taste in my mouth, so. We'll get on to that later, right? So, obviously, Everton fans taking many shots at Ross from, while he was on the bench all match. And, obviously, every time he got on the ball, whistling at him and jeering him. But, I mean, can't really expect anything else, unfortunately, at this point. Uh, running down some top-line stats, Chelsea was 68% of possession, 15 shots, only four on target. Uh, 875 touches, 688 passes. That is right. Those are low for Chelsea this season. Uh, the one big thing I'm super upset about are the five offsides, and I'm pretty sure they're all Alvaro Morata. Four yellow cards for Chelsea. That, to me, I think is just another sticking point that we can talk about. But anyways, as we do not run through the goals because, well, quite obviously we don't have any, that means we can jump right into the actual meat of it. So uh, the first question I want to throw out there is, is Jorginho, Jorginho, sorry, I know it's got a bit of a Portuguese flair to it, Jorginho, the weak point in the team, Jose Mourinho and Marco Silva have now both publicly stated that marking out of the game or marking Jorginho out of the game is the key to breaking down Chelsea. Is that exactly what happened today, Nick? I mean, Nizar has been posting multiple tweets about this is by far the lowest number of touches and passes he's had in any game. Is it that simple? It, it seemed to be a, a major point of emphasis uh, for Everton. And they committed a bunch of people um, in, in shifts to, uh, to to mark him. And it, I don't know, guys. Like, th- I think this is just part of the like the natural progression of things. Like, teams have watched Chelsea up to this point pretty much just had their way in in terms of possession and passing and especially some of these short passes to like regain possession back and forth. And, you know, not a, not a whole lot of crucial passes from Jorginho to this point uh, in the year. But I would also say that he just is the controller of tempo, right? The reason he's back there and not in Golo Conte is because um, yeah, Maurizio Sarri wants something a little quicker. He wants the ball to move around. And you didn't see that today. In fact, this reminded me a lot of a, a Antonio Conte midfield in terms of like, the, the, the pace and, and how things were moving around. So um, may, maybe it is the key to, to break in Chelsea. Um, however, then it, it would be up to Maurizio Sarri to have a, a counterpoint to that. And I didn't see anything today that would suggest that he has any sort of backup plan. So um, for the first time this year, and, and it's November, you know, whatever, 10th or 11th now, uh, I think I can officially point to Maurizio Sarri and say, yo, what's the what's the plan here because uh if if it i guess if it's if that is all it takes uh dan to to break down chelsea then we need a backup right yeah i, I mean i think you know you look at this this is one of the the lowest pass completed games for Jorginho in his time in the premier league uh you know not really even glancing above the 50 mark which Again, you know, it, it's one of those things that it's a stat that's fun to look at, but it's not really relevant until it produces the one most important outcome, which is a goal. I, I do think that you were seeing, and, and again, Nizar kind of calls out the fact that, you know, both Sigerson and Richardson were dropping back to disrupt Jorginho a little bit at times and taking those shifts in to do it. Uh, they found that to be more valuable than really pushing pushing Hazard out of the game. And, you know, while they did play, I think, a pretty physical game, they conceded 11 fouls throughout the, you know, the, the time that they were on the pitch. It, it just felt like he wasn't, he wasn't given the space of the opportunity. And, you know, whether that's, you know, Conte or Kovacic coming back to help out, uh, it, it definitely is a problem, especially when teams are going to give you the banks of four that we've struggled to break down. On top of that, if we can't get passes out or distribute appropriately, we're, we're going to run into some really significant problems, Rand. And I just don't see, um, at least with the personnel we have right now, um, how that's going to work effectively when you don't have a game changer beyond Jorginho, Hazard, uh, really on the pitch. 
But that's not a good enough. Res- it's like, not. <laughs> to me, like, like really, you mark Jorginho out of the game, or, like, just mark him and then Chelsea are done. I, I just don't buy it. I think that there are deeper problems, personally. But also, so last week on the fan cast, Chidge and Jonathan Kidd and and I believe it was Tony. Anyways, they were talking about how, um, you know, essentially they thought that Jorginho was kind of the unsung hero of Chelsea, which to be fair, I don't think he's too unsung. I just think that it's kind of like Conte. Everyone knows what you're going to get from him. You know, he's essentially like a seven every game. He's just a motor. So anyways, I actually tried to watch him a lot whenever I could on the camera. And he was, he, at one point I saw the ball with Aspi and it ended up going all the way back across the the back line and he essentially went from the right wing all the way to the left wing and never got it and there were chances to get it to him and he was just frustrated but i'd be too i mean he essentially ran 45 yards didn't get the ball and if we don't get it into him then apparently our system just breaks down and so to me i just thought that there were it, it, just, it just can't be that easy for sorry and maybe we'll get into a little bit more of like is, is sorry too stuck on his system? Or is it more of a uh, Kovacic and N'Golo Kante weren't being available enough? So as a center mid, Mike, you know this, that they need to check to the defenders, right? They need to come get the ball. You can't have one midfielder essentially checking back and the other two upfield. There has to be a little bit more rotation in my mind when it comes to that midfield three. Yeah, I mean, if we're going to be honest too, it... <clears throat> It wasn't just Jorginho who was off his game, too. I mean, our passing, I think, pretty much across, you know, top to bottom was pretty poor today. A lot of just misplaced balls or poor touches. Um, you know, as far as what Jose said, I mean, this this is obvious, right? This is, you know, in American terms, this is a quarterback of our system. Why wouldn't you pressure and blitz him? I mean, teams, you know, teams did it when Georgie, or uh, I'm sorry, when Fabregas was having uh, great seasons, you know, and what? was the down years uh 17 18 people just started pressuring him and we had pr- trouble working it um from you know the you know working it where we needed it to be so I, I don't think that this isn't something that we can't overcome i think that you know on a day that maybe Sergio put up you know mediocre results no one else stepped up and um i definitely think there are ways to combat this i think i think maybe this is just I don't know, this is what I was expecting from the beginning, and I think we just need to game plan a little bit more. Uh, uh, But they were disruptive. They were intentionally disruptive to Jorginho. So I think... I, I get right, you know that the the team is tired. That you know we we had a, a late Thursday game, a, a pretty long road trip back to Stamford Bridge, and, and a Sunday kickoff. Not a lot of time for recovery, and you know. I, I just I'm really you know I, I think there has to be some level of credit also given to Everton and to Silva who I think has shown in a couple of appointments that he can put together a pretty good game plan uh, and they came and Everton weren't necessarily playing to win the game in my mind that you know they they walked away with a great result for them so I mean credit to Silva and credit to Everton for finding ways to disrupt Jorginho and disrupt our team effectively and take advantage of. I think a, a very tired Chelsea uh, starting eleven. Yeah, but you know, don't give him too much credit because a couple plays here and there, you know, we we walk away, maybe we squeak out one nothing, two nothing game, and all they did was frustrate us, and uh, you know, and we still get the result. You know, Murata's what should have been a penalty in the box, or so uh, you know, Alonso hitting both posts or just being close. I mean, yeah, they put they basically played, uh, you know. You know, put eight behind the ball and pressured, you know, Jorginho with one to two people. But, you know, it worked in this situation. I think if everybody, if other people had played better, it would not have mattered. I think it would have, you know, I think we could have spread around that pressure a little bit better had we been on top of our game. So, I mean, Everton were in a four, two, three, one. So, obviously, their formation is. You know, there, there's going to be holes uh, in their midfield five, and I know that. Um, you know, you're saying, oh, well, there's, you know, five versus our three. Remember, we saw our, our Ford attackers on the wings to come back, you know, Eden and William. And I thought they did a decent job. But I don't, to Nick, to me, I just feel like that the system has to be much more dynamic than that. I actually don't think it was mainly Giorgino, which I should clarify. I don't think he had a bad day, except for that horror tackle. Um, 
I just think he wasn't involved, and I think that there's a difference. But for me, I think that with Sari, he probably wanted the team to be much more dynamic. I thought we just didn't move the ball very well today for whatever reason. I don't know if it's because we were afraid Everton were going to whack us uh, if we let them get too close or what, but the, the team just really seemed lax in possession, and there was no real urgency. And if there's one thing that Maurizio has with his, his Sari ball, it is move the ball with speed and urgency. And I really didn't see that except for that 10-minute kind of spell where Eden, you know, turned on the switch and just dazzled. I, I think you're right, um, and I don't know why – you're like Everton's not like a chump team, you know. Like I don't know why it took halftime and and a, and a hair dryer from Mauricio, sorry, for the team to like snap out of it and, and turn on, you know, the the, the turbo mode. But it, yeah, I think there was just a, a lot of misplaces, misplaced passes. I think there was a lot of lax possession. I think there was a lot of mistimed runs. I think there was. A, a abundance of offside, you know, runs like it just there was nothing clicking today for whatever reason, and it just seems it seems odd, right? Like Chelsea didn't play well against Bate on Thursday. There's zero percent chance they played well. We got really lucky to come out of that with a win. So it, in my mind, and, and again, I'm not playing, I'm not practicing, I'm not coaching, I'm not doing anything. I'm sitting in a chair right now. Um, being a fat ass, but in my mind, I think like coming out of that, you know, okay, we got we got the we got the result, but yikes, like that was not a great result. Let's bring it on Sunday, you know. That that would be my mentality, and it just didn't seem for whatever reason, Dan, it just didn't seem like they came out ready to to rock at all. It, Everton controlled the first twenty minutes, and and I didn't think it was that close. Ooh, can I jump in here? Because this is a perfect transition, actually. Dan, do it, do I th- it. I think that that question actually comes down to leadership, and so to me, I was, you know, I know Dave is vice captain, and Gaz is on the bench, but who are the leaders in this team, especially today on a day, you, the the players needed someone to turn to. Uh, when things aren't necessarily going 100% right, and you need someone who can drag the team over the line to get three points. And I feel like David Luiz made some marauding runs and, and tried to create some urgency, but o- overall, I guess, who do you look at as leaders on the team in general, and do you think that they stepped up to the plate today? So I, I think, you know, Louise is one that you mentioned. I think the two other names that come to mind for me in terms of leadership on the pitch today uh, has to be one, Rudiger. And, you know, I think he's kind of shown that he has uh, a bit of, of passion to him, a bit of fire and, you know, a willingness to kind of drive on and continue to compete. And I think you could say the same was true for, for Alonso, you know, really threatening down. The wings didn't want to seem to settle in, in the same way that maybe a, a couple other players were just visibly frustrated and maybe let the emotions of the moment get to them. And we saw a couple of cards maybe come out of some, some poor challenges or tackles that, um, you know, uh, friend, friend did not have a great game in any uh, way, shape, or form. But, you know, part of it also is down to even, you know, the adversity of opposition and also incompetence. Uh, you must find a way to push forward and have resolve. But I think those are the three that I would identify, Nick, in terms of the leaders on the pitch today. If I were going to kind of, you know, no, no ranking to them, just those are the three that I would have looked to potentially try and push us just a little bit above. And each of them in their own way tried to do that. It just wasn't enough. I agree. Um, I thought David Louise was, uh, you know, for the most part, imperious. I thought that Rudiger had a very good game. Um, I, you know, for the first time in three matches, I thought Dave actually played pretty well um, for the most part. And, you know, I thought Alonzo was also, you know, someone who really tried to, to give it a go. And uh, besides the back line, I don't know if I saw a lot, you know, to be completely frank. And, and I'm a lover of Ingolo Kante, but you know, I didn't see a ton of a ton of emphasis or, or go, uh, go get it from him either. So, uh, you know, I think, I think there was just a, you know, it, it looked to me and Mike, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. It looked to me like there are a bunch of guys standing around waiting for someone to make a decision. Uh, and, and typically the person who answers that call is Eden Hazard. And 
outside of the 10 or 15 minutes he played well from like the 55th to 70th minute per se he you know he didn't really answer the bell and i think a lot of people were you know looking around you know for something else and we didn't really do anything else yeah, it's a bit disappointing. I mean, I think the the two front rows of three played some really uninspiring football today. Um, it almost reminds me of some of that malaise that we saw under Conte where, you know, there's just trotting around doing stuff, but it's half ass or, you know, Eden pops up for a few for a chunk of the game and then just disappears. Um you know, and to be honest, leadership wise, there was a, a point in I think a deep into the second half in which Murata's just running his mouth off at the ref and Dave kind of yells at him and and walks away. I, I want to see Dave grab Murata by the kit and yank him away and tell him to shut the hell up, especially when he's already on a yellow. You know what I mean? Like get your you know, put your get yourself together, get your head together, you know, stop worrying about the fans and and the defense and you know, put in a fucking goal. And that that's how you shut up the other team. You know what I mean? Like go do something rather than, you know, chattering at the referee. So um, I think, like I said, w- what can be said about Rudiger? I mean, the man just produces. He, he was an absolute beast. And, and there were times where he just single-handedly won that ball back and then kind of willingly told the rest of the team, go do something. But, but I think, I think the problem is, is that a lot of people are going to talk, talk tactics. I just don't think that, about six people showed up for this match. There's not much you can do with four people, five people on the pitch. I mean, my problem, I think Rudiger is an amazing leader when it comes to defending, but he doesn't talk up the pitch, if that makes sense. I think that, oh, yeah. that I don't think that Aspie does enough either. I think David Luiz does. Someone needed to go to, to Maratza today grab him by the the back of the neck, pull him in close, and essentially say, you're better than this. Stand up, be a man, fight, and you'll get your goal. And no one did. Everyone just kind of stood and watched him fall apart in front of them. And I just don't think that's good enough. I think that you need someone on the field who can recognize that what we all recognized was happening. Murata was throwing a fit and having one of those days. And you have to say, hey, remember last week? Remember the last two weeks? Like... This is this is where you're at. Like, be persistent, and it just wasn't there to me. And and then maybe that's, I don't know. I just to me, I thought we were missing a bit of a vocal leader. I think David Luiz was the closest we got to it because he was pushing the tempo and essentially really trying to to get people on. Um, I was a little disappointed with Fabregas's appearance. I felt like unfortunately he didn't do anything. You and Mike, man, just slayed in Fabregas. I don't understand. But I mean, you've this got is, an agenda. It's, you're putting it's it together new for me. Our our, te- our text thread, was like I was in the middle of typing how Mike <laughs> was going to freak out when Fabregas came on, and he was like, "Just quick draw McGraw over here, and just pow pow." I'm not going to say anything about the substitution by texting <laughs> the entire group. <laughs> It just wasn't a great day for him. But I think that actually Nini had a good tweet today, and he was saying that there wasn't a lot of space in the midfield. Everton fussed out the midfield, and our wings just didn't provide what we needed to, unfortunately. So, uh, like I said, overall, I, I guess I'm just looking for multiple leaders out there today, and I just and they, they can you know cross between lines of offense and defense. And I just didn't see it today, and I think that that was something that was missing. And unfortunately... Um, to me, I thought that was kind of uh, a big part of the, the the difference between the two teams today. So I guess, I mean, overall, Nick, um, Everton played a pretty negative style today, overly physical. Um, you know, they, they weren't too dangerous. I think their first shot came in like the 60 or 70th minute in the match. Uh, I'm sorry, first shot on goal. And I think that might have been the Sigurdsson, um, you know, shot essentially uh, from just outside the 18. But I mean, they really weren't too dangerous overall. It was more of a, the headlines are written that Chelsea dropped points because of what we didn't do with the 68, almost 69% possession. Is does that the way is that the way you see it? Yeah, I do. Uh, and the only reason I would say that is because we were home. We're expected to win this game, even if it would be kind of a tough game. And, you know, frankly, I think we, we blew an opportunity today. Like, I said this two weeks ago when I was on the show that, the difference between City and Liverpool 
right now and Chelsea is that in these type of matches, they find a way to get a goal. Now, I, I will say they also find a way at times to give up a goal, and we didn't do that today. So maybe you know take that for what it is. But I, I think in general, presented with a tough you know back line or a tough opposition in terms of you know defensive stalwart tactics, you know City will always find a way through. Liverpool will almost always find a way through. Chelsea uh, didn't really, and and look it. I know Alonso came close twice and was really unlucky to not have a brace. Uh, and that, you know, if Murata knew what side of the defender to be on, that he might have had a couple as well. But, you know, it's not good enough. They, that, that is, it's, you know, if, if ifs and buts were, were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. So you know, I think this is just one of those deals that like this team is going to have to learn from Dan and, and grow from. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think <laughs> if some buts, uh, you know, you're, you've come back and, and bringing great criticisms, Nick, and I appreciate that, uh, that, that and everything makes this result a little bit better. But I, I think narrative, narrative wise, like we, we actually have eked it, you know, put together some, yeah, you know, the coming back to go level with United, um, you know, th- there is resolve in this team to to go and make something happen. And, you know, I really would chalk this one up to just, it. you know, we, we've gotten into this fixture period where every three pi, pi days, 3.4, you know, one, four days that we're going in and playing a match right now. And it's tough. And I think it has to come down to, you know, like who, who are the, who's the players that are going to step up and that are going to have the trust of sorry to allow him to rotate effectively. Um, you know, we saw the first little bit of Callum Hudson, a versus, you know, Bate. We saw Giroux finally score a, a goal as well. So we know that, you know, maybe that's going to spark a little run for him. And if we can, you know, start to, you know, give, you know, William or Pedro or Hazard the right type of rotational break. So Hazard's the one that I think sometimes when he isn't playing or stops playing, he takes games to like return to form appropriately. So just play the man all the time. Um, but in terms of everybody else, like getting that right rotation mix put together, I think will help alleviate some of the challenges we're running into and, and identifying what's our plan B, Mike, when we kind of come up against these defenses that want to give us the two banks of four. Like it, that has, that and how we respond is is still the question for Sorry to solve. No, 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 no. No, Dan, no, no, no. I said Hazard should play every single game and should travel. I'm pretty sure you said last week he shouldn't even be on the flight. Bullshit. Well, no, I, I, he shouldn't be on the flight to Bate um, if he's recovering from a back injury. But yeah, I mean, he got cle- he got cleared from the injury. You're changing your story. Well, the, the medical team changed their assessment. You know, <laughs> oh, you, have to, you have to. Uh... <laughs> You to, I mean, look, nobody listens the full 60 minutes to an episode. We know that. Wow. I mean, they probably didn't there hear that. <laughs> Square between the legs. <laughs> Cut a fluff. Oh, uh, yeah. So this is like Courtois and goal. Oh. 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 <laughs> you know what? I, I think overall, I, this is this is my take. Um, we're four hot. points. It's hot. We're not going to win the league. And, and people need to get that out of their heads. Breaking we're, news. <laughs> we're, no, no, no. But you're watching the frustration of what people are doing and the angst and the anger and all the bullshit that's happening on social media is because we're close and people are like, well, if we just did this, we'd be there. Well, here's the deal. We're not going to win the league. We weren't ever going to win this league this year. Sorry is doing better than we could have hoped. And and while, yes, we, we definitely dropped two points today, I think people need to keep some of this into context because this isn't the squad that he wants. Um, we're going to change things. And he's making do with a pretty, you know, with a team that did not do very well last year. You know, he's he's making the, he's Frankensteining it together and making it work with someone else's team in a completely different style. Um, and I think that when we sit back and we look at, you know what's going on, and realizing all the different, you know, all the potential positions that we can improve upon, and and pulling new people in, and you know, recruit the the players that Sari wants. I think we'll be in a much better spot. And you know, of course, there were a million, not a million, there were a lot of opportunities for us to win this match today. But you know, things are going to happen. And well, I mean, here's the deal, though: Chelsea have gone from tenth to winning the league. 
like that is just in Chelsea's DNA. We've talked about it. I think people have hope and belief because there are a ton of Premier League title winners in this team. Look, I mean, you're four points off City, you're two points off Liverpool, and you are one and three points above Tottenham and Arsenal, respectively, with a much healthier goal difference as well. I mean, I would say it's unlikely that Chelsea are going to win the league, but like you have to remember though, and I think it's I think it's healthy that that the Chelsea fans want to will the team onto greatness. And that is why Chelsea are better than Arsenal and they're better than Spurs is because our fans and our owner hold our team to a higher caliber. So yeah, I I would say I don't want, I agree with you in the sense that we don't want people being negative and kind of freaking out, but I would just say like, let, let's keep the momentum going. Like, let's ride this wave. We are in a great one run. Let's not just sit back and be like, oh, it's okay. We weren't going to win it anyways. Like, no, like let's push on. Let's, let's see what crazy things happen at the, you know, in the end of the season. But it, I, I would say it's a, it's a balance. That's not what I'm saying though. I'm not saying that we, we shouldn't push on or we shouldn't do everything. I'm just saying we need, we need to have some context to our feelings at times and realizing in which we, this is a limited squad. You know, you, when you look at a position, you know, a player like Moses, wing back, well, he, he's not even playing. You know, we, we have limited pieces to how we're playing. And so maybe some of the conversation might be tactically, how do we, you know, do we not play, you know, 3-3-4 uh, three, three, for Europa League? So we do something else or, you know, to give some better rest. But I do think that we can be honest and say, like, is there a chance we could win the league? Yes, there could. We we could pick up a, a world class striker and you know or a, a winger and and you know get the extra goals that we need, you know, in the winter break. But I think with the pieces that we have now, we should be. I think we, we just we shouldn't be falling apart over a draw. Um, that that's just my. So point. the only thing I think I would add in there though is a, it's a four point difference at the top right now between Chelsea and Man City. And while I will definitely be the first to admit that like my preseason prediction was City win, Chelsea two, Liverpool three, Arsenal four, which is probably more likely to happen than Nick's um, top four prediction, which we will continue to remind him about every single week until the end of the season. Um, it is. It, until until it's mathematically out of contention, like I would hope that the mentality be that we get disappointed about dropping two points and that the team continue to push for albeit as difficult and uphill a battle as it is against the financial doping of Manchester City, which you can read all about that in the articles that have come out this past week. Um, when, they, when you're backed by a country and a city state versus being backed by one oligarch, um, there's just a cash difference in terms of what you can put out on the pitch. But if a, a Aguero gets an injury, if you know um, De Bruyne is out longer than anticipated, you know if you know Liverpool, you know, if Salah gets a, a bad run of form, you know like there's so many like variable things that can happen over the next you know twenty uh, you know twenty six uh, matches here that like there's a likelihood that this thing could go down to the last one to two matches, and like that is something that you know I just hope we don't lose sight of, and like the you know, the what is the presumed outcome like we have to reject that a little bit and say you know what like yes this could be the outcome but look at where we are at right now look how quickly we've moved past like what the expectation was initially and like now like but by product of sorry overachieving like the expectation has now become inherently higher for him in what he should be able to accomplish within the first uh, you know first season that he has here so it's not like he is he's now the victim of his own success in that capacity but that that's a great thing for us as fans and supporters and like we need to be excited and push the team forward but we also shouldn't say like that it's you know, we, we won't win the league. Like there is still a possibility until we were mathematically eliminated to say that we, we, we have a shot just as much as Liverpool and just as much as city to win the league. Guys, life is about setting expectations, right? Like if, if our expectations were top four and we come second, everything's gravy. If we set a, a vision for winning the league and we come second, everything's terrible. Like, I think Thank we you. all we all would have said at the beginning of the year, if we finish top four, get back to Champions League, keep Eden Hazard, that look, man, that's 
that's just about as well as we could have hoped to do this year. And if that happens, no one's going to be looking and around and saying, uh, you know, we should have won the league. You know, maybe. I mean, if we if we lose it in heartbreaking fashion on the final day, then I'll be pissed, right? But, like, let's just keep everything in perspective. We are making leaps and bounds every single week, even on shit weeks like this, where the playing style's better, the fan atmosphere is better, everyone's back kind of on the same side and sort of split into two different camps on whether or not they like Antonio Conte or not. Everyone seems to be kind of jiving the same direction. And that, to me, is a really important piece of this because the the fans in general, and, and we know from our Twitter audience <laughs> at times, can be a little bit divided, right? And, and in general this year, I think Maurizio and co. have done a very good job of coming together, making everything more of a family type of atmosphere, and saying, hey, we're going to just go for this deal. And maybe there are days like today where we're not going to do it, um, but it's not going to be dreadful to watch for the most part. And we, we think that by playing this style, we will have a chance at the end of the year. Okay. okay. Cool, man. Cool. Like That's good with me. All right. So so here's here's some, here's some a perception. Um, I perceive that Chelsea are average if Eden Hazard isn't fit and our chances of winning drop drastically when he is not healthy. I agree. I like, look, man, like I got to be honest with you. I I think I've given this enough time now, Dan, to, to, to really put this in perspective. I don't think William is the guy we thought he was going to be in the system. Like the miss, the miss that he had today with all the time in the world, and I texted this in the group in all capital letters, it really frustrated me. He had all the time. All he needs to do is either blast it near post or place it far post, and he placed it pretty well wide. Uh, I don't think he's the solution or an off-day you know, pick-me-up to Eden Hazard not having a great day. Then you look at Pedro maybe on occasion could fill that role. Then you look at, at Ross Barkley, maybe on occasion can fill that role, but like none of these guys are going to be that consistent. So if Eden doesn't play well, Dan, where do we go? It's back to that question. Uh, yeah, we, we go up uh, Shit's Creek without a paddle, and it's uh, it's not a good place to be. It is definitely something where, you know, you know, we look at Murata today with the multiple offsides and the challenges there. You know, there's there are players that can still have you know have a ceiling to be coached up to you know. But at you know, if any of these players are you know at thirty, thirty one, whatever, like there's only so much coaching is going to do because like their potential as a player is like has a, a less of a lifeline essentially to be. Um, a time frame in which they can kind of put to use that type of skill and what that coaching is going to do for them. So I think we've talked about the fact that like this squad needs, you know, some additional, you know, infusion of talent. Um, and, but on an, you know, we, we've got to see on an off day what happens. And we've also seen, you know, and Hazard though, when he wasn't fit and we didn't need to start, you know, William and Pedro together, um, you know, with Murata, is that, you know, he, we also won that game too. So, I mean, like, we are capable of winning a game without Hazard. It's just nothing that uh, I want to see too regularly. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a tough question because what, what is any, what is any team without their best player? Right. Um, I do think that we're overly, dependent on on hazard um but what team won't it be on him uh, unless you have the luxury of you know oil money from qatar uh you know but that said i i think we can do better things to support him i think that i, I if anything um i think this is a, a lesson for sorry himself to go back to the drawing board he's got to figure out a way of how to break um to break a flat eight, a flat nine, flat ten. However, these teams are defending against us, there has to be better ways to defend against it. And you know, if it's starting a Barkley alongside with Kovacic uh, and Jorginho, or you know something else, we just have to come up with a new a new solution because we're just trying to plug in the same pieces, and it's not it's not working well against some of these teams. We're typically getting those results, but 
you know, we're getting a little bit lucky or, you know, and luck just wasn't really on our side today. Um, so then, so if you guys agree, then I guess then we should bench Hazard until he's healthy at all costs, right? No, I'm serious. <laughs> no, honestly, if he's not good enough at 70%, then like you should sacrifice in the short term. Like he shouldn't play again until he is 95 or better percent healthy, in my opinion. It's just, it's not good enough right now. You have so, an international so break, Dan, where you know Roberto Martinez is going to go F it up. He's going to throw him out there. He's, it's only going to get worse. And then we have to come home to Spurs. Yeah, I, I guess the question is, is he not fit? Because if he's not fit, then yes, you should rest him. But if he is just playing his way back into form, which is something we've seen over the course of his career at Chelsea, is that when he has come back from injury, it does take him a little bit of time to reacclimatize and refine his form. And again, like he has been probably outperforming a little bit his expected goal um, ratio for the first start of the season um, from where he's been contributing. And so there's there's that to take into account as well. So, like, you know, he's never really been an every, you know, every goal, you know, every game score a goal individual. Um, but he was kind of starting to trend towards that level or every, you know, 90 minutes, you know, every 100 minutes or 110 minutes, whatever it might, it might be. So I, I think that, that that's more the question I, I would understand, Nick, is like, is he unhealthy? Because if he's unhealthy, then he should not be played. But if he's healthy and just working his way back into fitness, then play him at every opportunity because we see what happens when he does get those opportunities to play and shine. Like he just finds himself in a rhythm and that rhythm usually doesn't stop until he is forced to stop. Yeah, I, I think the only thing that troubles me in, in, and I'm being serious about this is the back. Like the, the back really worries me. I, I, I've had a, a bum back before and it's, and I'm not a professional footballer. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, it, it really, it just messes with your entire, your movement and everything. And I know that he has access to medical personnel that um, I clearly didn't um, due to the not being a professional footballer thing. Um, but still, to me, this is like beyond like a calf or like a muscular in, uh, injury to me. Like this is a worrisome one. You know, if he's getting... You know, if he's back to goal and he's getting knees and, and, and sh you know, getting shoved in the back and, like, a bunch of that stuff, I think it does affect the way that he plays. And, and you know, so it, in that regard, I would hope that, you know, the team would be able to pick it up, you know, whether it's Ruben or it's Pedro or it's William or somebody, um, you know, be able to pick it up in his absence. But, uh, you know, if, if he's truly fit enough to play, then I then, you know, at the same point, and we've said this before, and I'll say it again, I expect him to be him. You know, I expect him to, you know, to play well for an entire match. And so if you're out there and it's not like a, you know, an FA Cup final or a Champions League final or a, you know, last game of the league season type of deal where, you know, we're just trying to gut it out for 90 minutes, then... I expect you to play better than you did, and he didn't. He didn't play that well today, Mike. And and you know, let's call a spade a spade. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's a fair assessment and and unfair at the same time. I I think some of it's a mental aspect. I mean, not to say that Mazard has any mental issues, but can you imagine? I mean, the amount of fouls that that dude takes a game, and he knows that he's not being protected by the referees. And he should be. And I think what we're watching is we're watching beautiful flowing football be cut down because, you know, referees are allowing either systemic fouling or just heavy freaking tackles all the time and, and just, you know, barely blowing a whistle or letting it slide or, you know, not not reaching to their pocketbooks. So I think it's I think it's a little bit tough. I mean, I hear you on the back stuff. I haven't played football in two years because I messed up my back uh, and. It's 2016 in October, but I don't know. I, I think the answer isn't necessarily we shouldn't have to put all our eggs in, you know, Hazard's basket. The to me, we need to have uh, 
you know, a right winger who is truly dangerous. You know, I think we have to, we have to change the squad. We have to make it so that teams cannot defend a single player. They cannot, you know, put two men on Hazard, two men on Jorginho, and have other dudes who are just incapable of, you know, applying pressure uh, when somebody's being double or triple marked. All right. We're going to save the rest of this for another time, gentlemen. Uh, let us move it on uh, to the man of the match poll. I apologize. Before we get to the man of the match poll, uh, Nick, we have a new promo code for World Soccer Shop. Correct, Brandon. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so if you use, in addition to our code London Pod, which, of course, you know by now, gets you 10% off uh, your order. If you use the code new kits for... Um, free shipping on on just the new Chelsea kits this year that will get you the the free shipping that you need. So you can do, in addition to London Pod, you can use the code New Kits and get your free shipping. That way you can just take money off of your order. Bada bing, bada boom. We're miracle workers. That's all I'm saying. So do that. Code New Kits. Code London Pod in your face. Boom. Respectfully in their face, right? Just to be clear. No, but just but for real in your face. Oh, okay. Um. All right. Well, uh, no additional thoughts or comments. I gave you plenty of time to get through it all. Uh, Dan, you are very mild in uh, man of the match poll today. Just didn't give you a lot to work with. You know, what can you do? No, I didn't. And, you know, I probably could have, uh, you know, included just the back line and made it to made it that. But, you know, yeah, more, uh, more we always like to do things. Yeah, would have liked to, uh, you know, like to do fun things with the match poll. Uh, Alonzo, 15%. Kepa with 9%, Rudiger with 36%, and uh, the offside rule, Nicholas with 40%, was the man in the match for the game. <laughs> Don't do it, Nick. Don't do it. Look, I, I know Dan's tricks pretty well after four and a half years, and uh, I saw this one coming uh, from a mile away, so I will not indulge. So, so the flag was already up. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to be fair the flag up was pretty clever so he set you up with a bad joke to knock you down with a good one Uh, that's next level that is that's well played (laughs) you're welcome (laughs) oh man can you tell we're in our fifth season guys yeah i didn't either all right well as the table stands uh man city boring as hell in first place for the 17,000th week in the last two seasons 32 points liverpool climbing over chelsea after the drop points uh they're in second on 30th chelsea in third on 28 uh spurs are shit 27 points in fourth arsenal fifth at 24 points they had to come back to draw wolves um so they went from not having lost a match I guess they still haven't since Chelsea to since they played us. Um, they 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 wobbled a bit, as you would say, for them. So, uh, anyways, competitive top five. Uh, it starts to drop off after that. Bournemouth uh, in sixth and Watford in seventh on twentieth. Yes, Manchester United have tied in eighth, also on twenty points. So, anyways, that is the table. That is how it stands. We will go more into the top four, top six in part two because. Hate to break it to everybody, but it is another international break. That is right. Oh, the nonsense is oh, back. But oh, this, oh, this break. It's true. Before we get to the international break, don't worry. We will have part two coming at you guys uh, this week as well. So if you're listening to this on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, whatever, and you haven't listened to part two yet, make sure to go get that as well uh, to help kind of fill in that gap. But anyways, gentlemen, uh, it was nice to have the four of us on. We haven't really done that. So I, I think it went pretty well. So thank you guys. Um, we will all be back for part two. So again, just just make sure to tune into that. Uh, and again, just thanks for listening. It, it is literally as simple as that from all of us from the bottom of our hearts. We really, really do appreciate you guys. But in return, we do ask you to reach out to us via social media, text, email, our website, whatever it is. We want to have a two-way dialogue. So with that being said, Chelsea fans, that is a wrap for this episode and until next time you know what to do keep that blue flag flying high